Good, how are you? Well, I'm so happy to chat with you again. We did a lengthy one for Robert the Bruce. I remember. I remember. What is this? We go from 14th century Scotland to the 1880s Old West? I'm just an old soul. You know? <laughs> I like the classics. Well, I love the classics, and I love them when you do them. Oh, it's lovely for you to say. Thank you so much. As much as what you and your DP, John Garrett, what you delivered with Robert the Bruce, building on Eric and, and Angus's great script, you have now done that and more in bringing Yellowstone City to life. Oh, I, I'm so happy you enjoyed it. Eric did a masterful job with the screenplay, and Johnny G is just, you know, we were able to build this town over three years, and so we were able to build this town over three years, so it was just, um, we had a lot of time to think about it as we were in, um, as we were in the... Um, the lockdown? As we were in the post, no, <laughs> as we were in lockdown, but also as we were doing the release of um, uh, Robert the Bruce, we were already in prep on, on this one. So it was great to have the core team back again. You you blew me away with this one, not just because I just love old, I love the old West. I have always had, that always a soft spot in my heart for Westerns. And to see the Old West transformed and created with as much authenticity and depth and texture as you have done on every level is just amazing, Richard. Just amazing. Right down to your set decoration, the construct, the physical structures themselves, this town. It feels like we have stepped back in time. It's stunning. Absolutely stunning. Yeah. So happy to hear it. Yeah, it, it, it's a bit of a dream come true, getting to build a town in the middle of Montana <laughs> to, make a, to make a movie. It's a pretty special experience. Hey, well, you know, at this point, you can always lease it out to Taylor, Taylor Sheridan if he needs it for some 1880s footage. <laughs> well, at least I'd be able to charge him top dollar. That's right. But <laughs> the, before I even get to this incredible cast you have, my God, it's mind-blowing. Talk to me about what you and John did visually with the visual tonal bandwidth because what you have done capturing the air and the light, it's magical. You've got, we get the dust from the ground, but then that's a very specific light that's up there in that Paradise Valley area. It's cleaner than a lot of other areas, so you're getting a more authentic kind of light for the period so i'm curious what your thoughts were working with john and what you were looking for visually with light and lens yeah we we chose to shoot in may um you know just over a year ago we wrapped um because it's a really beautiful time here because it's not quite the summer but you get the clouds and the rain and there's still snow on the mountains and the light is very soft Mm -hmm. um, and you get, we wanted the weather, like we didn't want it to be stark summer or stark winter after this one, which we did in Robert the Bruce. And so a lot of it was, well, I've worked with Johnny for so many years. Um, we now uh, just have a confidence in, in only shooting the time of day that, that we want to shoot uh, particular scenes, um, just because controlling the town on the back lot here. We can, shoot in, we can shoot inside at the times we don't want to be outside. So it was really just about picking and um, uh, choosing uh, the times of day to film. And because we built the film ranch, because we built Yellowstone Film Ranch, we had the luxury of going, no, we're going to go out today because the clouds and the sun and the light is just right. We wanted it to be soft and voyeuristic mm -hmm. um, because of the nature of the murder mystery in the movie um, and then just shoot at the right time of day and try to just observe these characters because it's such a strong, strong cast. And Eric did such a great job of writing great roles into all of the characters. Mm -hmm. Well, and something, uh, call me, tell me if I'm mistaken, but it looks like also with your interiors, uh, with quite a, such as with the church, you were also relying a lot on natural light as opposed to blowing out uh, with, 
extra lighting. Yeah, actually two-pronged effect there because usually in a film like this, the, the interior might be studio mm -hmm. and then the exterior, so you're forced to uh, green screen or blow it out. But because everything was real here, the church, the saloon, the brothel, delivery, the jail, uh, the town hall, like the theater, everything was real and outside is real. And so we're like, we want to embrace the out of sea outside. Um, and that was awesome, I think, for the actors because you could walk in and out. We tried to do a lot of walking in and out of buildings to show people that we're here. We're here. Mm -hmm. um, and this is real. And where we built was called Yellowstone City in the 1860s, so we really wanted to embrace being out of being inside and out. But. Mm -hmm. I, and that just astounded me because you get some of the most beautiful interior lights, such as in the church, also in Emma's hotel room that she's staying in before she's going to make a break and, and leave town. The light coming through those windows, the light in Isabel's windows, absolutely gorgeous. And then John's capturing it with those sheer kind of cotton voile curtains that were the vogue back in, back in the 1880s. Just wonderful. Yeah, the prop production design and Johnny worked together. Even the wallpaper, if you remember it, in the saloon looks different in all the different lighting. Mm -hmm. It's got a texture to it. So we diffused the hell out of everything, and then we would wax up the windows so it would be soft coming through. Um, and we were just always trying, we were always just trying to put the, the best, oldest lenses onto the newest technology and just seeing how much it can be knocked, knocked back. The visual, the visual tone is stunning, Richard. So let's talk about this great cast here. How did you get all these people? My third film with Scotty and mm -hmm. then with Zach McGowan. And you see, like, you want to, I think a part of it, is, well, the majority of the, the majority of it is Eric's script, right? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to get Gabriel Byrne and Richard Dreyfus and Thomas Jane and Anna Camp, Amy Garcia, Scotty, um, Zach, Isaiah Mustafa, even Lute you know, there's so many in the supporting roles. He wrote roles for John Ailes and Lou Temple that were just blow, blow away roles. And Tanea Beatty from the phenomenal as Violet. And I think the reason is they read the script and go, oh, I have something to do here. Mm -hmm. Like Zach McGowan and Dunnigan bring so much energy to the table, which is so important for what unfolds next. And Gabriel Byrne hasn't done a Western, but, you know, grew up in Dublin going to see Buck Rogers and going, going to Westerns. Thomas Jane has done a lot of Westerns, but Nat Wolf, Nat Wolf's a phenomenal actor, and he, he's a dead ringer for Gabriel Byrne, and they play such a terrific father and son. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you believe they're father and son from the second that you see them in the first scene of the movie. So I think first and foremost it's a screenplay. You don't get that type of um, a talent without um, without the actors. Um, and so across the board, um, from the deputies, to the general store guy, like everybody, if they said a line, they had something really important to do in the movie. Mm -hmm. Well, and with the casting, Thomas, yes, he's done Westerns before, but, and Tania, uh, you know, she's now got a great role recurring role once on uh, Yellowstone as Avery. But the others, they're not known for Westerns. And I love that you went against type with with your casting here. It really yeah, that, it's refreshing. Yeah Gabriel, yeah, Gabriel Byrne, you know, when I was growing up, you know, in Miller's Crossing and Usual Suspects and Stigmata and that time where he was just in everything great. And then Richard Dreyfus, obviously, before that, Doors and American Graffiti. But I haven't seen them in Western. Yeah. Um, and so that was really fascinating. Anna, Anna Camp, the same. Um, Amy Garcia is brilliant. You know, they said you shouldn't have a Latino or a Spanish um, Madonna of the brothel. And it's like, that's bullshit. Amy Garcia is a force. Yes. Um, and everybody who was from anywhere was in Montana in the 1880s. And... I love how Eric opened us up to such a diverse cast. Isaiah Mustafa is, is so point, poignant and stoic, um, and I'm just so happy we cast him as well. Like the, it's a really, it's a tribute to the story. And with this story, you've done something here. You and Eric have done something here that we haven't seen really seen before. You have you've done a genre meld here with westerns and murder mysteries. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's what was the thing I was trying to put my finger on, because it's a classic Western in a 
style. But the murder mystery is really interesting uh, to me, and that's what we gravitated to, and we thought about a lot with Johnny with the cinematography. But the the idea of doing a whodunit in a different, in a classic western shape, was was exciting exciting to us. And sometimes blending genres doesn't work, but this really felt like it's still it's still all the way a western. It just has some deeper layers. Yeah, because you're used to seeing westerns where somebody gets killed, but we all, do all the time somebody gets killed. Yeah, and usually the, the bad guy is the stereotypical bad guy to blur the lines between right and wrong and good and evil, mm-hmm. and you just have people that were trying their best. Some of them doing it for the right reasons. Some of them making horrific choices. The morality issues that you bring to light here are really interesting, Richard, particularly with Thomas's Thomas and Anna's characters of Thaddeus and Alice. The morality that we see and the backstory that eventually comes out is really fascinating. Similarly with Isaiah's character of Cicero, you really hone in on this. And again, it starts with Eric's script and with the performances, but then the way this is shot and then the way the pacing in the editing process, what you and Joe uh, have done with the editing is amazing to find those beats and that breathing room and those aha moments, but uh uh-oh, it's not an aha. How challenging was that to find that perfect structural beat? It's really hard because there's so many characters and everybody's like, um, you know, two hours is long, two hours is long, and I'm like, I don't see it as long as all with what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and look at Isabel Ruby, look at Josephine. Like, she has such a beautiful daughter uh, process with Anna and Amy Garcia and then Thomas Jane. Um, I need all those moments early in the film so that you care about them when the shit's going down at the end. And uh, I wasn't interested in the 90-minute version of this film because Amy and Tanea and Josephine uh, and Anna and Cicero, um, Isaiah, we needed to care about them in their current life before we to care about them at the end. And so the whole goal is that people will care enough to stay with us for the first 45 minutes right? mm-hmm. to get to know the town because uh, we don't have the luxury of a TV series and getting to know these people <laughs> hours and hours and hours, but I still need you to know them before, <laughs> before people start dying. <laughs> Um, to hopefully care about them more than you usually would. I cannot see this any shorter than it is. Personally, I could see this even being longer than it is, Richard. Oh, I'd love it to be longer. Because there, there is so much depth, especially when you get into Richard Dreyfuss's character and John Ailes' character, that whole dynamic and relationship there. John Ailes is a phenomenal actor, and he, he did an amazing job and with Richard Dreyfuss and the subtlety in which Eric pulled that off was quite magical. It truly was and I would have loved to see more of the two of them. I would have yeah. loved more backstory from Tanaya's character of Violet. Oh, Tanaya is phenomenal um, and she's the reason for, for it all unfolding the way it does. Um, but yeah, John Allen and Richard, that was just beautiful the scene that, the scene that they have together they're fleeting but it, if it leaves you wanting more then then hopefully we've done our job mm-hmm. oh i definitely want more i would have been yeah. happy i would have been happy with another i could easily see another 30 minutes here richard oh well maybe we do a tv series hey i'll watch that uh, <laughs> i've got to ask you after all the challenges you faced you know in bringing robert the bruce to life and that whole world of 14th century Scotland. And now you step into the 1880s Wild West, Old West America. In bringing this story to life, because you're not adverse to challenges, but what would you say you learned as a filmmaker in, in stepping into this world, coming out of a totally different world and now, and now fully realizing this one? What would you say you learned as a filmmaker that you can now take forward with the next world that you decide to create? I love history, and I think that uh, we now 
understand we have a responsibility when you make something like Robert the Bruce or Yellowstone City. It's the best thing to go to open a history book and, and look at it deeply and then try to see as many different angles on it because who was writing it at the time and how is it, was it real, was it not? And I, I just love doing period films for the research angle of it. Uh, so what I've learned is this, this, this is probably my favorite thing to do. Um, and so we're going to do another one and we're going to do a James Douglas film on a much bigger scale because, you know, Robert the Bruce um, uh, it was never meant to be Braveheart. It's just a little fairy tale that I just loved for the for the characters and the and the story. Um, but now that we're getting you know uh, a bigger bigger canvas, I just love. I just learned in myself that I love being able to research something thoroughly in history and try to take an angle on it that maybe we haven't seen before. Well, definitely melding these genres certainly gave us a new angle on, on the Old West, I can tell you that much. Yes, ma'am. One last question for you, Richard. I'm curious, in all of your research you did in bringing Murder at Yellowstone City to life, was there one surprise factoid that jumped out at you that you really were surprised by? I'm just trying to come up. <laughs> I'm just trying to remember for you. You know, Montana was such a multicultural place uh, in that time period. And uh, as much as I've researched the railroads, um, with the Scottish, uh, Chinese, Italian, Black, Hispanic, Hispanic Spanish, Mexican, um, English, um, Texan, the, the, the melting pot that it was, um, which I'd read about, but it was just really, really important to, to revisit who, who, who built uh, this, this country. And it was fascinating and one of my favorite things to do. I can't wait for you to go do some more research and bring me another film. <laughs> it won't be long. You do know that now you're going to make all of the Yellowstone TV series fans really happy with this film? Because we're all going through withdrawal waiting for November 23rd for season five. I hope so. You know, I, you know, this place was called Yellowstone City in the 1860s, and we're, we're just 30 minutes from Yellowstone. And Taylor Sheridan has done so much to reignite a passion that never died. It was just a lack of content. And so if we can provide something in the, the intro, um, it's exciting for, for all of us. Richard, as always, a joy. And I can't wait till we talk again. Me too. Hopefully it's not too long. Thank you so much for your support. Oh, Richard, my pleasure. I can, and I look forward to the next film. Me too, love. I'll talk soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.